Well, the Lord be with you, and Merry Christmas to you on this, our second Sunday of Christmas. Uh, I hope that it's been a really special, meaningful holiday for you. Um, even if you've had to modify or perhaps simplify your normal celebrations, I hope that this has been a very meaningful Christmas for you. Thank you for taking some time to be with us in worship um, and welcome the South Roanoke United Methodist Church. Now, uh, we don't have a whole lot of announcements because we, we've had a very busy season and so things kind of slow down a little bit here for the next week or two. But I do want to make mention of this afternoon an opportunity for worship to extend. If you'd like to participate in drive through communion, you'll have an opportunity to do that this afternoon. Um, on today, January 3rd, between 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock in our parking lot, you're welcome to come by and receive communion. And like I've done in the past, as you come forward, you'll receive a, a elements that are prepackaged. I'll distribute them and then have a little prayer, if you'd like, uh, with all those in the car. And then we'll ask you to remain in your vehicle and then just simply uh, proceed how you see fit. I hope you'll, you'll uh, take the opportunity to, to see me this afternoon. Well, let us proceed then with our time of worship and, and let us do so by first centering ourselves and, and focusing our attention on the holy. And let us do that by going to God in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, as a star rose and drew people from great distances to Bethlehem, that they might greet the Christ child, draw us your church and all of your people to you, that we might be the church and the people who you call us to be. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. I invite you now to listen to our first musical selection. We three kings of Orient are Bearing gifts we traverse afar Field and fountain, moor and mountain Following yonder star Oh, star of wonder, star of night Star with roar Well, if you joined us last week, then you were, I uh, hope, uh, blessed 
to be a part of the Lessons and Carols service where you were reminded of the great story of salvation, beginning in, in Genesis and working its way through the scriptures. And after each scripture lesson, there was also a corresponding piece of music. Well, of course, we, we read the Christmas story not too long ago, and we're reminded of it again last week, at least parts of it. This morning's text, it deals with Jesus as a child, a small child. What next, you might be asking yourself. What do Mary and Joseph do immediately following the grand spectacle of the angels and the shepherds and the wise men? What to do next? This morning's passage is an answer to that. I'm going to be reading this morning from the Gospel of Luke, and I'm going to be reading from the second chapter. Verses 22 through 40. Many of you may recognize the two primary characters here. Aside from Mary and Joseph and Jesus, we're introduced to a a man named Simeon and a woman named Anna. I invite you now to listen. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus with them up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it was written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple that day, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For any eyes, excuse me, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared In the presence of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel. And to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet named Anna, the daughter of Phanel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, and she worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, Mary and Joseph returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When the documentarian Philip Groening wanted to make a film called Integrate Silence, 
He approached the monks, the Carthusian monks who lived at the Grand Chartreuse Monastery in France and asked whether he could record portions very quietly and very discreetly, portions of their lives. The monks said they'd think about it. Sixteen years later, Groning received a letter in the mail. It was from the monastery. The monks had thought about his request, and they had come to a decision. He could begin filming. Well, very clearly, it seems as though time is designated a little bit differently in places like the Grand Chartreuse Monastery in France. A little differently than it is arranged in the rest of the modern world. The monks there mark time in their own way. Things unfold at a much slower pace and after a great deal of contemplation and prayer. So that when things do happen, they're significant things. Important things. Things that come as a result of a great deal of discernment. And consideration. When I read this morning's passage about two elderly strangers interrupting, interrupting the proceedings of Jesus' dedication in the temple, I'm struck by how long Simeon and Anna must have been waiting for a Savior. Simeon, the text tells us, was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was a faithful Jew, a, a devout person who longed to see the Messiah. And in that way, he wasn't all that unique. The faithful of his day, they all waited expectantly for God's arrival. The words of the prophet Isaiah were familiar to them. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people. Prepare the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Despite the fact that Isaiah's prophecy was now 600 years old, comfort had still not come. Since the time of the exile, Israel had been invaded and conquered and wiped out time and time and time again. The day when a, a Jewish monarch sat on a throne was a long, long time ago, a distant memory. But the promise that this would happen again was an ever-present hope. It was believed that the Messiah, the anointed one by God, foretold in Scripture, would come to restore the people and restore the nation. And not all was well in the world in which Simeon lived. So, of course... He longed for redemption. He longed for the Messiah. Anna too was a faithful, holy woman. And she was said to have fasted and prayed in the temple every day and every night. Her dedication indicates that like Simeon, like much of Israel for that matter, she longed for something. One commentary put it, puts it this way. These two aged saints are Israel in miniature and Israel at its best. Devout, obedient, constantly in prayer, led by the Spirit, at home in the temple, longing and hoping for the fulfillment of God's promises. And upon seeing Jesus, Anna confirms exactly what Simeon has said. The long await is over. The Messiah has finally arrived. As relieved as Simeon and Anna must have been and must have felt, I'm sure that Mary and Joseph, the young parents, were equally confused. By that, I mean that that we'd all be startled and probably taken aback a little bit, maybe even a little annoyed if, if two Two individuals stood up in the middle of a baptismal ceremony and made their way to the front of the sanctuary and, and took the child in their arms and began to make bold predictions about who that child would grow up to become. Try to picture the scene in your minds. Try to imagine what it must have been like 
This old man standing there scooping the child up, probably giggling to himself, or maybe tears rolling down his cheeks, or maybe just staring off in the distance. Whatever the case, he was filled with this kind of joy. He was, he was overjoyed. Then he announces that, that this is enough. He's ready to go now. He's ready to die. He can finally die in peace. He has seen salvation. And he can now depart. And just as he sits back down, another person, an elderly woman in the back of the sanctuary, stands up and says, I see it too. He's right, you know. I see it. But what exactly have these two individuals seen? After all, it's just a child. A powerless Speechless newcomer to the world. Whatever salvation this baby might bring is still a long ways off. It's just a promise at this point. Whatever wisdom he might impart, it will remain hidden for a few more years. Nothing is happened yet. The evil King Herod still sits on the throne and Caesar still governs from afar. The world looks just the same as it ever did. And yet, and yet both Simeon and Anna, they stand there in grateful praise. It's the future that they see. It's the future that Simeon believes he holds in his hands. He has seen it and and touched it, and it gives him great satisfaction. It is, as he says, enough. And then Anna, also approaching the end of her days, she adds her two cents, her own joy and praise to the moment. She'll be telling everyone that what she's seen that day. She'll be telling people about a child that she'd never met before and had only interacted with for a few brief moments that I have seen salvation. Who knows what Simeon and Anna expected to see that day when they came to church. Maybe they envisioned a day when a a strapping hero type came striding into the temple on horseback and set everything right again. Maybe they envision a day when someone with the sculpted good looks of King David strode through the courts and made everything just again while angels sang and people fell at his feet below. Whatever the case, whatever they thought they might see that day, when they actually see When the Holy Spirit fills their hearts, what they see is far simpler than all that envisioning. They see a child, a baby, an infant. They see a poor family. They see a mother and a father who, despite what we as readers know in terms of what they've been told about this promised child, were blown away by by what these two strangers have told them. Luke says they were amazed, which is really just a a polite way of saying surprised, taken aback. You see, Simeon and Anna, they had prepared their whole lives for this miracle. And when it finally happens, when it finally arrives, they recognize it immediately. And they know exactly how to respond Now, perhaps we will never have the patience of Simeon or Anna. Perhaps we will never have the patience of the Carthusian monks and the Grand Chartreuse Monastery in France. But I believe that we can have a component of that patience. I believe that it is possible to gain some of the proficiency that these individuals exhibit. 
I'd like to think that it is possible to prepare ourselves in order to better recognize the miracles of God so that we don't miss them when they happen. Now, I'm not an expert on this. I'm not exactly sure how long it takes in order to develop this kind of patience and discipline and proficiency. But I am certain it takes practice. It takes intentionality and it takes a great deal of awareness. In a now famous article in the Washington Post called Pearls Before Breakfast, a journalist followed the world-renowned violinist Joshua Bell as he made his way down into a metro station in Washington, D.C. during rush hour. Bell picked a corner, very subtle, out-of-the-way corner in the metro station. He pulled out his violin and set down his case on the ground and began to play for tips. The article begins by saying this. Each passerby had a quick chance and choice to make. One familiar to to commuters in any urban area where the occasional street performer is part of the cityscape? Do you stop and listen? Do you hurry past with a blend of guilt and irritation, aware of your cupidity, but annoyed by the unhidden demand on your time and your wallet? Do you throw in a buck just to be polite? Does your decision change if he's really good or what if she's really bad? Do you have time for beauty? Shouldn't you? What's the moral mathematics of this moment? Unfortunately, only one individual recognized Joshua Bell that morning. You could count on two hands the number of people who actually threw in some money into his violin case. And at that, nothing more than a few quarters. You could count on one hand how many stopped to dance. One was a child, no much older than six, maybe seven years old. Friends, from the time that you open your eyes each morning to the time you close them in the evening, ask yourself, do you see beauty? Do you stop and see? Or do you hurry past the day? Are you kind to other children of God just to be polite? Does your ch decision change if they're polite back to you? Simeon and Anna, they prayed and they fasted and they worshipped every day. And I imagine that some days were much harder than others. I imagine some days they were wondering to themselves, will we ever have a Savior? Will the day ever come when we greet the Messiah? But they remain diligent. They trusted in God's grace nonetheless. And when God does show up, they recognize it immediately. At Christmas time, we remember that God came to dwell amongst us. Emmanuel, God among us. May the Lord find a place in your heart and in your home. And like Simeon and Anna, may you recognize God in your midst. And when God does show up, may you know exactly how to respond. God's help may be so. Amen.
Well, we turn our attention now to this morning's prayer. And we just lift up all of those names, those individuals and situations that are contained in our prayer list that you can find in your email announcements. We also, of course, lift up our world, our community, our nation, as we're all dealing with concerns and struggles that may be on our hearts or in our minds this morning. Let us go now to God in prayer. Good and gracious God, as you gave Mary your Holy Spirit, filling her with the delight of your presence, fill us now with your Spirit and renew our lives. As people streamed to Jesus' light and kings to the brightness of his rising, draw our nation and all those in positions of power and authority to your brightness. As angels sang glory to you and proclaimed peace on earth and goodwill amongst all people, bring us your peace and bring an end to terror and strife and division. As shepherds were drawn away from their flocks by night, draw those of us who do not know you yet to the knowledge and love of you. As Jesus was born in a manger because there was no room for him at the inn, be especially present with those who have nowhere to lay their head, those who are vulnerable, and those who are hungry. As the Holy Family gathered together in Bethlehem, and traveled together to far-off lands, bless all families, Lord, especially the families of our congregation, and protect those who may be traveling. As your Son came to proclaim the forgiveness of sins and the gift of life eternal, give to the departed eternal rest, and let your perpetual light shine upon them. O oh Lord, our God, may the light and the hope of this Christmas season and of your Son's incarnation reassure our hearts that you are among us, that you hear our prayers, and that you will be with us always, even to the end of the age. And now, Lord, it is with the confidence of the children of God that we join our voices in praying our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, it has been my privilege to be in worship with you again this morning. Again, I, I hope that this has been a very Merry Christmas for you, a joyful one, a meaningful one, one that you are sure not to forget anytime soon. I thank you also I thank you for the many ways that you have helped to support your church, your church family. I thank you for your prayers, your participation, your gifts, your service, your witness. A reminder of our online giving options. If you haven't taken advantage of that, it's a very simple process to set up online giving. Perhaps in this new year, you might want to do that. There's ways to set up giving at a one-time or a repeated frequency. You can also give to specific uh, areas of ministry that might be of interest to you. 
there's a lot of flexibility to that. And also, of course, alleviates some stress on our part as a church. It takes less time to process and less volunteer attention to count if our giving is done electronically. Of course, also, you're welcome to drop your gifts in the mail or bring them by here in person. However you choose to give, we thank you. We thank you for the ways in which you gave in 2020, and we thank you for the ways that you are committing to give in 2021. I will continue to lift you up in my thoughts and prayers and ask that you do the same for me and for our church family. And as you go forth about your day and your week, may you go forth with this blessing, this benediction. May the light that began at creation, that continued through the witness of the prophets, and that has come to fullness at the birth of Jesus Christ, be in your hearts and in your minds. And as you go about your day and your week ahead, may your spirit be filled with joy and with hope. For God's precious light has been given to you. Go in peace and know that God's peace always, always goes with you. Amen. Amen.